Oh, well, hello, Wembley. <laughs> hello. Lovely to see you all. Thank you for choosing us over the other two, frankly. <laughs> I think they're worth it too. But you can still watch the other two lots back as well, as I will be. Thank you so much for joining us. This session, as you probably know because you're here, unless you made a big mistake, is about women telling the stories. So we have a producer, we have content creators, we have a really scary producer and executive. She scares me still. Um, but they all... Not me, not me, this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Sarah, the blonde one I'm referring to. Um, but everyone has experience, their own experiences, uh, very different experiences about working in this wonderful world of football media and in particular many of us work in women's football but having worked in men's football as well and there will be time for questions so don't you worry about that not just from me thank goodness so we have Sarah Collins the scary one if we're doing Spice Girls <laughs> uh, executive producer I'll tell you what I want what I <laughs> she will tell you what she wants don't you worry about that she won't mince her words um, executive producer of Talk Sport bringing all her experience from BBC local radio uh, into that as we'll hear about Deborah Halliday production manager of Sports Beat who's going to tell us all about content creation etc and two of the absolute queens of content creation of making yourselves um, helping yourselves to earn money in this industry. You don't need to rely on other people to do it for you in particular, which is really, really interesting, um, which is um, Rachel O'Sullivan and Sophie Downey. O'Sullivan being in the uh, Ireland kit, because they're going to the World <laughs> Cup, in case you weren't aware, from Girls on the Ball. I'm sure you follow them. Uh, Nia Wynne Thomas, who is senior producer of Sky Sports, including the women's football coverage, and she has a lot going on. A lot going on. <laughs> and uh, Rihanna Perara is content creator who is going to tell you all about her very own experience and gets a big whoop from down here. I think so too. <laughs> and the poor love has just had a big stress getting here because she's been involved in Inside the WSL. So let's crack on first of all. Um, Sarah, first of all, tell us a little bit about your job now and how you see the landscape of women working in football media in particular. Um, so my job at Talk Sport, which is the world's biggest sports station, um, is exec producer. And that can mean anything. They say, oh, that's nice. What does that mean? Um, so actually, the, the role that I do was created for me. I went, there were two jobs up for grabs, um, a football editor and exec editor. And I'd, I'd do any if you want. And they actually said, you haven't got the job. None of them. I was like, oh. Um, and they created a job for me because when I had my interview with them, I talked passionately about valuing staff, about inclusive, inclusive, being inclusive. <laughs> See why I'm not on the radio, everybody. Uh, and diversity as well. <laughs> it's going to be like that all day. Get ready, guys. Um, so yeah, so, so, so the, the two fantastic bosses that I had, uh, Lee Clayton and uh, Laurie Palacio, they empowered me to do that. Um, and that job was about bringing change in a radio station that needed change that still needs change and I'm sure some of you know that when you want to bring in change it's quite a hard job because some people either like change or they don't like change and the team that I was with at that time um, and Lee Clayton the, the boss at the time will tell you this was a very white middle class male um, production team um, so you can I'll let your imaginations work on how a northern blonde old woman went in saying, don't do it like that. No, yeah, yeah, this is how we do it here, Sarah. No, 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 we're going to change, that's how we do it. And that's my job. My job is changing um, the way we work, changing people's ideas. So I'll give you the basic, um, a basic example and then I'll, 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 I'll pass on. But for example, two and a half years ago, working on the boot room, which is Darren Bent, Darren Ambrose um, and Alex Crook. And they were doing a poll and it was, who's the best sportsman in the last 10 years? So I was like, nee, can we say athlete, elite athlete or sports person? It's like, well, why should we do that? So I said, just because as a woman, I'd like to quite hear that women are getting considered on the radio station. And the other point is you lot have all got daughters and it would be nice if your daughter grew up knowing that she was a part of the world, the radio station, women do exist. You know, I wasn't bothered if any women made the top 10. I kind of didn't care that, what I, about that. What I did was I got those guys, the presenters and the producers and the APs um, and the phone answerers to think about the language that they use. And that's the massive thing for me. I, I didn't realise that 
many, many, many years ago when I compared sexism when I was doing my A-levels in 1989 when none of you were born, I was doing sexism in the paper, that I could influence the narrative. We have to change the narrative. You have to change the narrative. We'll pave the way. Everyone here changes the narrative, and that's what's really important. So challenging language and explaining. Guys just didn't get it. What, one of the things we've got at the minute is about daughters. So I said I'd be quiet. Pass on. <laughs> Pass in the baton, else you'll never shut me up. <laughs> Sorry, ladies, it's going to be a long hour. I should have just got you all a cup of tea. You could have just sat and uh, <laughs> so just enjoyed it, Sarah. So next year, we'll just give Sarah her own show. <laughs> don't, don't, but, don't, um, don't. but yeah, but just taking the point out, I mean, kind of joking aside, this is one of the reasons why I love Sarah, is because she does actually say it like it is. She will challenge. We spoke about an incident which we can't talk about, but she challenged a practical example of how she spoke up and said, that behaviour is not acceptable and made a practical difference. And those are the kind of things which have to happen if we're going to move forwards from the situation that Sarah came into at TalkSport, but it could have been elsewhere, mm. and into the world in which we all want to inhabit and, and show women's sport for, for the great products, for want of a better term, that it can be. Deborah, from your perspective, what do you do? <laughs> as, as the Queen would say, what do you do? Um, so I'm head of production at a content creation agency. So we work with... Um, the FAWNL, the WSL and the Championship producing content for their channels but not just for them across kind of the world of sport both men's sport and uh, and women's sport providing kind of the the content for social media and one of the things that I is running a department which is male dominated sometimes but also we have brought in a, a change in kind of diversity within that is having difficult conversations it's about education but people keep talking about education from when you're in school. I actually think education needs to happen at all stages of our life. It doesn't matter if you're 13, if you're 15, if you're 30, if you're 55. It's about listening and being able to provide safe spaces to have those difficult conversations. And I think, I was about to say young, I'm not sure 30 is still young, but we're going to go with it. We're going to go with it. We're going to go with it. Is I have found in my role, I get questioned, oh, you're head of production at 30. A man would never, at 30 years old, be questioned, can, can you be running a team of both men, females, some who are older than you? But do people respect you? Do people respect you because you're younger than some of the people in your team, some of the male? Respect, you earn it. It's not delivered because, you know, your passport says you were born on a certain day. It's because people trust you and you trust your team. And I think, I was, when I was younger, was so scared to have difficult conversations, to challenge people's perspectives on women in sport, that I felt almost lucky to, to, to be in this space, that I didn't feel that I deserved to have a voice. And one of the things that was said downstairs is, we keep saying we're feeling grateful. No, mm -hmm. we are here because we've all worked hard and every single person in this room has worked hard to be in the role that they're in and deserve to be given opportunities. And I think that's what really needs to change is the definition between having a role because it's filling a quota, which it often is because, oh, we've got women in our industry. Are they the right women who have been educated, who've been given opportunities, who have grown in the game of football and within broadcast to truly know what their next steps are? And I think that that's why we're all here because it hasn't always been that easy. And I'm sure every single one of us has kind of faced adversity from people questioning, should you be here? Why are you here? How did you get here? <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> How did you get here? Um, so for me, that's, I think, the, the main thing that we've, we've struggled with and need to be sure that we're changing is that difficult conversation and not be afraid to challenge people who maybe aren't using the right language or who aren't understanding of how you got here and how you deserve to be here. Thank you for now, Deborah. We'll come back to you in terms of um, how people work for your organisation and the type of people you use. We'll come to that in a minute. Rachel and Sophie, sorry to lump you in together, but basically <laughs> it's just to give you the chance to say whichever bits either of you would like to say. But <laughs> these two women are absolutely phenomenal. I've followed them on social media for years. And I can do it. Not very long ago, there wasn't a great deal of women's football media coverage, but I'm sure a lot of you know that already. So with the advent of Twitter in particular, You've basically found your own space, your own voice, and provided content that mainstream media weren't providing. Is that fair to say? Can you tell us a little bit about how you started and what you guys are up to now? Sure. We actually, it was here at Wembley that kind of sparked everything at the London Olympics. 
um, Team GB beating Brazil, 70,000 people. Um, that was kind of the spark for our journey. And we went away looking for more information about women's football. And of course, there wasn't really that much at the time. You know, you had your OGs like Jen O'Neill and you had Tony Layton. But in terms of kind of wide coverage, there just wasn't a lot of it. So we went away and thought we'd set up a, a Twitter account and start trying to cover as much football um, as we could. And I guess as the game has grown, we've grown. Like we've adapted with the coverage, like what gaps are there still to fill. Um, we've taught ourselves a lot, like a lot of it's been learning on the fly, you know, doing alongside our jobs for I think maybe nine and a bit years we did it alongside our jobs, full time now, which is brilliant. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of finding the gaps, trying to fill gaps of, of content and coverage and whether that was live feeds or sometimes we'd be the only pair at a, an England game in, I don't know, Kazakhstan or Belarus or somewhere like that, um, to, to now, which is a completely different landscape. So. Yeah, it's been a great journey, and I think probably when we started, never would have dreamed we'd be working full time on it. So it's amazing that it's happened in such a short space of time. Yeah, the landscape has changed so much, and um, I think for us, it's football is at the heart of it. The women's game is at the heart of it. The players and trying to tell their stories as much as possible, um, but also trying to make it accessible to fans as well. So, you know, when we go away to World Cups and cover tournaments, it's bringing everything around that experience um, to life. So it's the travel part of it, it's the embracing new culture, making new friends, all of the stuff that goes around, say, a major tournament, all going to football, um, that makes it enjoyable for the fan as well. So uh, that's a really important part as well. So can I ask you how you went from paying your own way, effectively, to go everywhere, to now getting paid to go to Kazakhstan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it was a big leap. Um, and we did it off the back of a pandemic, which probably looking at it wouldn't seem like the right time to do it. Um, but we were both in, in good jobs at that stage and we'd had a year of like not really leaving the house. So we'd saved a bit of money as well, which was good. But we felt like now was the time that it was now or never. We had major tournaments back to back. We kind of thought if it didn't work now, it was never going to work. And we said we've We've 10 years of experience in digital marketing. If it doesn't work, we can, we can go back and find another job. At least that's what we told our parents. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think we took a leap. It was a big risk. And I think we had thought about doing it, maybe going part time or one of us doing it. Um, but it just felt like it was the right moment to kind of, it, you were coming up on a wave and it was like the right time to, to take the leap. And um, we, we've had a good relationship with Jo Tung for a while. She's been a great mentor before we'd even signed with Tongue Tied. Um, she was always a great person to chat to and gave lots of advice. And that's something I feel like in the women's game, there's a lot of people who are willing to, to give you advice. If you're struggling with things or you're not sure about something, like we are great at lifting each other. We're terrible at believing in ourselves, but there are so many other people around you who will, will lift you. And, and if they believe in you, you need to trust that. So we had that with Tongue Tied. We kind of pitched ourselves to them and, and um, very lucky that they took us on. So that's massively helped. And, of course, we've established relationships over the years. Um, and I think sometimes it's just making people aware that you're available to work. So it's kind of hard to do around a nine to five, but once we took that leap, you know, we were, we were saying yes to every opportunity. And you're thriving. It kind of helps that there is more profile now of the women's game and women, women are winning things and Ireland are qualifying for World Cups. <laughs> and it's all very exciting. <laughs> Nia, as a senior producer of the women's football at Sky Sports, just explain to people what that involves exactly. I know there's a lot more besides that, but how are you managing things there and how does it all work? It's busy. <laughs> uh, it's challenging. Um, it was just going back to um, what Jonathan was saying earlier about we want to make things different. Um, we have mic referees up. Um, we are going into the dugout. But we're behind on that from a WSL point of view because we've done it in the Premier League and we've done it in EFL. So my, my job is to, to work alongside my boss, Gary Hughes, and we select what matches we're showing, picking talent, booking talent, writing the running orders. I work alongside an incredible um, production manager, Rebecca Lee, who I couldn't do what I do without her. Um, but also, it's working alongside incredible people that we've got here um, today, and one of my colleagues, Kelly, who um, works on EFL, but works on all kinds of football. And I think that's really important for us, is I don't work just on, on WSL, I'll dip in to do some EFL. And, and I think, having come into Sky, I was petrified. And because 
you're, you're told, oh, it's a culture, it's a culture. And, and similar to what you were saying, it's, it's a culture that I think at Sky is this perception is, is outdated. So actually when you kind of come in and you think, oh, actually, it's, it's not a bad place to work, it's not utopia, and no, but nowhere is. But I think also as well that the, the, the fact that every single person in our football team has completely embraced women's football across WSL um, and the SWPL, where we've got our first game on the 27th, which coincides with Women's Football Weekend. Um, Rihanna was in on the show today, the girls have been in. It's, it's, it's a, you know, you, even when you walk into the building, there's a poster of Sam Kerr, and it's not just because we want, we think it's the right thing to do, it's because we, everyone believes in that. And we want to bring some kind of parity to the coverage. And that's maybe why I was brought in, because I used to work on Premier League football and I was at the BBC back in the day. So, but you can't have, I mean, I think we'd be wrong to think that we've got parity because where the games are, as you know, Jackie, you can't have certain cameras in certain points. And I think we all know from, you were there at Arsenal last week when you've got a camera up on a gantry with no roof. Um, it wouldn't have been any different if we were there. I think the only difference is you, we would have been able to cut away and, and show a different camera angle. So we want to bring parity to the coverage, but unfortunately we can't to a certain level because we can't bring a back cam in, can't bring VAR in because that's, that's where the realms we're working in. However, what we can do is ensure that people that work on our football coverage work across all of our football coverage, not just from what you see on screen with um, Kaz or um, Mary Earps or with yourself, Jackie. Um, you know, we've got male colleagues. Gary Taphouse is one of our male commentators who works on WSL. You work across both. That goes on behind the screens and also in front of the screens. And that's where we can try to bring some kind of parity and some kind of equal that what you see is, is we bring the same production values to our coverage, not only for digital um, linear, but for digital too. And I think that one of the earlier conversations, which was here about tapping into that digital market in order, we, you know, we're fully aware that we are behind a paywall. And part of that is to ensure that inside the WSL, where we address really important topics off the pitch, is available on YouTube. Our TikTok account has exploded. Um, mm -hmm. Twitter has kind of gone a bit mad. But also those negative comments that you see on social media, they're kind of going away because we're not going away. So, okay, if you, if you don't want to pay for the coverage, then leave. You know, if you, if you subscribe to Sky Sports, you probably don't watch every single second of Sky Sports. I don't watch F F1. Lots of people do. But it's that set, and it's going back to what Sarah was saying. It's, it, I'm happy when, when I came in that culture had changed, but, but I'm even more happier that people that work on our football work on our football, regardless of gender, mm -hmm. of what the game is. Yeah, Nia just um, <coughs> touched on it there, but um, there are a lot more challenges that you face in terms of scheduling and cameras and what you can do at games. And, and there's no reason why people watching at home should know about those challenges, but they're saying, why have they put that game on there? Why have they put that game at that time? And, why, why can't we see VAR here? Why can't we see the lines here? It's just, there's a long way to go and there are lots of challenges behind the scenes. So it's not all Nia's fault is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, Rihanna, Rihanna, just tell us a little bit about yourself and how, what you do and how you got to do what you do. Yeah, so um, I started out um, doing TikTok about women's football. I think I followed the women's game for as long as I can remember. My dad always made it very accessible to me when I was younger. Like the moment I showed any interest in football straight away, I had idols like, you know, Steven Gerrard and John Henson, but also Alex Scott, Barry Williams, Lucy Bronze. And that's always just how I was raised. And just the women's game was always something that I guess felt natural to me. And off the back of the Euros, obviously, it's blown up like crazy. It's like never before. And I think online I noticed such a gap as well between, I guess, the new fans and the old fans and how um, there was a lot of gatekeeping going on that I was seeing online and people didn't want it to be as accepting and welcoming new fans, which to me is crazy because if you want the game to grow, if you want to see the sellouts like we've seen, you need the new fans, you need to be welcoming and make a place where anyone can learn about the women's game no matter how much knowledge you have on it whether you followed it for as long as maybe like I have or if you started watching after the Euros and you thought oh this is actually really cool like I'd love to be involved in this um, so yeah off the back of that I started my TikTok and um, yeah since then I've signed with Tongue Tied and we've had some incredible 
opportunities. I'm working with Copper Nine too, Charlotte here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, just hoping to keep doing what I'm doing and spread the women's game, I guess, like Girls on the Ball have for so many years. Yeah. And Sarah, come back to you. In terms of people applying for work at TalkSport or, or you putting adverts out for people to apply, what is it that you're looking for, you personally, you as an organisation? And perhaps a few do's and don'ts would be quite helpful for people. Are there, are there people here looking to work in women's football media who are not doing as much at the moment? Or you, yeah, there's a few shy ones at the front. Um, but, but other people who are interested to know about um, about the landscape as it is, what would you say if you could talk to somebody who's about to apply to you? Yeah, so if you're applying for a job um, working in, in, in the media, full stop, um, <clears throat> your first point of call is that you do your homework and do your homework really, really well. Um, make sure you know everything about that organisation. Um, research the people that you're talking to on the board uh, or on the interview panel. Um, if you can make contacts with the people on the interview panel beforehand, do. Ask them, you know, what are you looking for? What are the, um, you know, what sort of uh, traits and aspirations do, do they want? Tap if them up, basically. Tap them up. Oh, you're uh, Absolutely, up. absolutely. Um, and <clears throat> when you go into that interview room, just believe in yourself. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again. You, you have to blag it. A lot of the female ladies, female ladies, a lot of the ladies in there, <laughs> a lot of you lot, uh, and gentlemen as well, but um, as women, we are known to look at a job, eight pieces, criteria, ten criteria, eight of them we can do, two of them we can't do, oh, I can't go for that because I can't do it. Right? You can do it. And if you can't do it, you'll learn to do it. So when you go into that interview panel, when you get the interview, make sure you represent yourself better than anybody else could. And as we've said, we're, we're very good at <clears throat> empowering each other, but not so great at bigging up ourselves. You've got to big up yourself. You've got to do it. You've got to be better than the next person. Like, everybody wants to be in the media now, and that's fantastic. Everyone did when I was getting in there. I started in the media at a local radio station, cleaning cars and reclaiming tape. Yeah, digital analog tape that you, I can't even explain. It's like, we didn't even have mobile phones. In fact, we had typewriters, but anyway, <laughs> I had a pet dinosaur in the corner. <laughs> you sent the audio by pigeon. <laughs> yes, we did. Oh my, I, don't, I can't even go there. Um, but do your homework. You know, it is competitive. So how are you going to stand out from the other person? Is it on your CV? Is it when you get in there, shake people's hands, look them direct in the eye and have enthusiasm? I know when I've interviewed people, I just want someone in front of me that can talk that is enthusiastic and I think, do you know what, they might not have that skill, but I like them for this and I like them for that. Just go in and sell yourself. It is one of the hardest things to do. It is really, really hard, but that is the thing to do. Um, but just do your homework, you know, and throw something in. I know I went for some interviews uh, at the BBC when I was in Manchester, because I was head of sport in Manchester, but I, went to BB I wanted to go to BBC Sport. I think the third, I, 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 I did five interviews before I got there, and the third one, I slated, they're like, what did you think of this show? And I went, oh, it was rubbish, it was this, it was that, and then afterwards I, I looked and I went, oh yeah, they produced that show. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're asked for feedback, um, can I swear, just do the BBC yeah. shit sandwich. This was brilliant, this was brilliant. Thought, thought, don't know why we did that, but this was brilliant too. So, 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 you, so they know you're not going in and fluffing because you are going to say something's not great, but don't go in and annihilate somebody's piece of work. <laughs> That's my biggest tip. <laughs> Just coming off the back of, of what you said there is about being passionate and how, about that drive. I have always said, and actually some of my colleagues in the back of the room here who, who are employed, I said, you can teach people skill sets, but you cannot teach somebody to have a good attitude if you have a good attitude and you're driven and you're passionate and you show that, I can teach you everything else. We can support you in every kind of um, pillar post that you need to hit and every hurdle you'll come across. But if you can turn up and show that you will turn up every day and give your best, that's, that's the main thing. And another thing I will say in interviews is, an interview is a two-way street. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that where you're going also matches your values. So as though you're sat there being interviewed, don't be afraid to ask them questions back. Are they the kind of company do you want to work for? 
Are they progressing women in, in football, in sport? Are they taking active measures to see change? And I think we often think, oh, I'm so lucky again to be mm -hmm. sat in this room, to be having this interview. Well, actually, they're lucky to have you in that room. And actually, you need to ensure that this is the organization that you want to work for, that the people there are challenging conversations, that are pushing forward, that are ensuring that the gray, uh, the, the gray? Great. <laughs> the game is growing. And I think that's an important thing is trust yourself, ask the right questions, but, but also know why you're there. Are they the right people? Is it the right organization that you're, that you're applying for? Yeah. Do your research in advance, yeah. basically. They will have done some research on you, or at least they'd have looked at your Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> they might have done a bit more. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, research. But I mean, I know people who've shown up for interviews at radio stations and have never listened to the radio station. Mm -hmm. They don't know any of the presenters or what they do and wasting everybody's time, frankly. And uh, if they don't have the drive, then somebody else will have, mm -hmm. and they're the people that will, that will get selected. And um, So, Rachel, in terms of... Um, you, you touched before on you started making content and uh, we've seen your tweets, etc. but you've gone from strength to strength. For people who are thinking, well, I quite fancy being a, a content creator, that sounds nice. I know there's a lot more work that goes into it, <laughs> don't worry. But some people, maybe some school kids might think, oh great, I, I don't need to go to university, I'll, I'll start creating content. What's the reality of, of what you actually do, how you produce stuff, the technical side of things? Do you need money to start off, for example? Well, yeah, I mean, we did this, as I said, for the first nine years with our with full time jobs. And actually, I got my first proper job because of Girls in the Ball. And we'd only been running it for about a year, but it was a digital internship. And I was able to speak on the fact that I was doing stuff uh, alongside work and um, that kind of fed into the role. Um, so that was how I got my first digital role. And I stayed in digital. I ended up my last job. I was head of digital comms. So I kind of use my career for Girls in the Ball. My employers might not like to hear that, but any time I saw an opportunity to upskill myself, it obviously helped my job because I was learning how to edit or I was learning you know, how to film or what sound, anything like that. And I kind of used the job that I was in to ensure that I was upskilling myself for Girls in the Ball. Um, so yeah, it's not as simple as you can just pick up. I mean, some people can, some people are just, maybe it's just me, but um, just picking up a camera and being able to do stuff, it is a lot of learning. Um, there's loads of free things online that you can learn as well. I've also learned from other people, looking at other people's styles or um, simple things like that. And it's, it's that kind of, you need to live and breathe it. And I think that's probably what has helped us in terms of expanding what we do and changing the way we do things is that we live and breathe it. Um, and you were touching there, when it's your passion, you will end up picking up so much stuff that maybe you don't even realize and i, I was going to say like you can't teach passion so that's what you need to kind of hold on to when you're, you're you're doing this and if you're wanting to work in it and i'd say also maybe looking at what are you doing now and how can what you're doing now help what you want to do in future and so how does it work in terms of press passes i mean you're now very well established everybody knows you guys and so you can, you can pretty much go wherever you want you can apply for accreditation but for people who are maybe starting out who haven't got to that stage where they can apply and go hi i'm me and i'd like to sit in the press box and then i'd like to interview players afterwards how does that work um i think it's just about networking probably is the main thing getting to know people in the, in the different organizations you know over the years we've built up like relationships with different kinds of people all over the shop so just whoever you bump into at a game and um, whether they're from the FA or from different news media or, or media organizations or whatever um, is just making yourself known and, and getting your face out there and saying why you're passionate and what you're trying to do and maybe giving examples of your work um, and then that respect I think comes from that as well and just being given opportunities I'm, as Rachel said there are so many people like willing to help you I, I find in this in this sport and in this industry willing to give you a sort of a, a helping hand or a boost um, so it's just not being scared to go for it you can only be told no right mm -hmm. you just have to ask um, and it's it's about just um, trying to build those relationships I think I was gonna say I think as well maybe picking and choosing where you start because sometimes you just need a couple of games under your belt to get that confidence in and then you can say like I've covered this match I've covered this match you know so maybe going to a game that you know is going to be really really popular you know we don't always get into those games you know we still worry about it so it'll be just that can I add on there actually a lot of <clears throat> people want to be commentators and presenters which is fabulous um, I say fabulous but we also need producers as well I 
can't find any female producers at the minute. BBC really? have loads. Honestly, BBC have got what loads do you mean of you female. You can't find any female. I go out to colleges and I'm always asking people, do they know female radio producers? Our female, I haven't got any female radio producers at Talksport. We've got Emma, who's off on maternity, but she is an insight because she works on special projects. Catherine Anastasi worked her way up through the ranks and is now fantastically deputy head of Talk Sport. Um, Ellie, who works in admin, has just become our head of live. So I've got no women actually on the ground, on the floor, so to speak. I've got Isabel, who does um, technical producing, but she's out at games. So I have women that come into my office and usually they come in answering the phones. I don't care which way they get in. And I'll go and say hello and they go, oh my God, thanks, I've not seen any other women. Um, so aside from what I was just about to say, you know, I am looking for female producers. It, everyone wants to be a presenter, but those presenters can't go on air if we haven't got the producers and the senior producers. But what I was going to say is, if you want to be a presenter and a commentator, you don't have to have a press pass. Go to a game, do the commentary on your phone. Um, the guys I worked with in Manchester years ago used to tape a tape, tape machine and record themselves and play it back and listen. You can do it at home from the TV. And actually, when you come into us for work, you know, I want to be a commentator. Uh, have you got any examples? No. Oh, yeah, I've got some pieces that are written. That isn't broadcasting. So if you want to get in there, don't worry about the press pass. You don't actually need a press pass when you get started. You know, do it. Send it to one of us. Please, will you listen back to it? Will you give me some feedback? Yeah, send it to anyone. Jackie's had that all alive. Please, can you help with this? Well, that we do. So you know what? If that's what you want to do, go out and do it. Have a do it from home. And don't be shy when you're doing it, because I've heard people do it. And they go, that was a great goal. <laughs> no, 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 it's not going to work. It's not going to so work. You know what, though? I think that the best commentators, presenters, reporters started out as APs because if you don't know how the job works, you, how can you expect just to kind of turn up and think that you know it? You, there's so many technical factors that you mm. have to learn as part of the job that, and if you haven't got that, those basics or an understanding of how it works, you're going to be really unpopular as well as a presenter because you need to know the nuances and understand what people's roles are what does so that person's on you know karen carney is, the, is a brilliant example she always asks who is on analysis for the game so she will always say oh hi sophie or hi kelly or whoever she'll have that conversation i mean she asks for the world in the analysis but she will she understands she's sat there she's been in the gallery and we do that now with with players we've had players coming in um and, and sitting with us during the game, Jilly Flaherty came in. She wants to she wants to be a co-commentator and a pundit, but she doesn't understand the technicalities of it. She's exposing herself, and, and it's just about understanding that a little mm -hmm. bit more. And and to your point earlier, I think back in the day, women were would pull the ladder up behind them, if that makes sense. Whereas now. I don't know any person that just isn't prepared to kind of reply to you or, or if we're really busy to say, just really busy at the minute or, um, you know, if I get a message on a Friday afternoon, I've got a game on it, you'll know if you've got a game on Saturday, it's not really, I can't really answer it right now. So just be patient and people will kind of get, Watch us again. get back yeah, to you. But, it's, but also we were chatting earlier, I think one thing that we're working uh, at Sky and, um, and my colleague Vim is here and he looks after our early careers programme so if anybody wants to speak to him afterwards and, and um, that is offering an internship and Jackie and I have spoken about offering um, you know Sky do we offer work experience no we don't believe in people working for free for two weeks you're not really going to learn anything mm -hmm. but how can we offer an internship to people not only um, kids that have gone through university for three years, if you've just left school, there's an internship programme that you can go on. And half of the people that we took on, um, just under half the people that we took on for the last two years are women. You know, we've, we've had a partnership with <coughs> Women in Football to offer three placement, three three-month placements throughout the season. We did that pre-pandemic. The person, the, Annie Thomas, who did it pre-COVID, pre now produces our podcast, Three Players and a podcast so it, it the opportunities are there and i think what we need to learn at sky and what we're working on is what do our job adverts look like so to your point sarah if you look at a job advert you think i can't do that i can't do that i can't do that how can we then reach out and make those job adverts a little bit more appealing to us as females who just have zero confidence when it comes to applying for jobs talking when you're sorry very quickly talking your point there about you're struggling with finding producers is that because also traditionally 
that role has been seen as a more male dominated role. I think somebody asked me the other day, well, how do I learn what this person does? How will I be given an opportunity to do it? Where, where do I learn how to have these skill sets? And I think it's one coming up, coming up the ranks. I started as a runner mm. and, and learn every skill set, know how to make a good tea as well, <laughs> important in every job. But yeah. do you think there's an element there of also opening the doors, not just a smidge, but throwing them open to allow women to come into that role and truly understand that they <coughs> deserve to be there as well? I think it, I think it ties in with the see it, be it, because yeah. actually we see a lot of people presented, and that's the whole point of the media, and you don't actually see what goes on behind the scenes. Yeah. So the camera operatives, the microphone, you know, the sound technicians and everything else, it's probably the same um, desk drivers, you know, trying to find desk drivers, impossible. Who goes to college to learn to be a desk driver or to be, you know, to do all the tech or anything? So I think part of it is that in that it can be seen as a male role, but I think also we don't, those jobs aren't highlighted. And I think as a social media, it's really glam to be a presenter, but it's not, is it? Because I've been with you guys at one o'clock in the morning, at Sheffield, when you were filing your pieces all climbing in the back of the car. And, you know, I've been studying, you know how cold it gets. We all know how cold it gets. It's not as glam as it looks. Yes, there's some great moments, and we throw them all over Instagram, but we don't put the unglam moments on there. So. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right in terms <coughs> of um, people coming in and wanting to be presenters or on air or whatever. I remember I started off after I did my, well, during I did my postgrad at um, Sheffield uh, and went up to do the non-league football for BBC Radio Leeds and I was paid £21 a week which I thought was phenomenal for, <laughs> for phone <laughs> it wasn't funnily enough I didn't do it for the money um, <laughs> and I phoned around which comes a shock I phoned around all the uh, non-league lower league uh, clubs and had a, a 15 minute slot on a Saturday which was just for me it was just phenomenal to learn the very bottom after I'd asked them if I could come in you know I'd knocked on the door saying I'd love to work in football I'm doing this postgrad. And they said, um, after I got into the office, they said it's quite unusual for someone to come in and actually want to do non-league. People come through here doing the, their courses and sort of think they're going to start on Leeds United, which you may or may not know is an enormous football club, <laughs> absolutely massive, especially when you live up there, you appreciate the size of that club. And wanting to do all these different roles, and, but want, you know, I've, I've worked in all areas of broadcast. Mm. I've done the sitting on the desk read, reading the tweets on the old football league show, the, the commentating, the presenting, producing as well, writing scripts, writing, 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 writing. And I think Nia's right in terms of if you know all those roles, then whatever you end up doing, you've got a better chance of doing. Mm -hmm. But just coming to your point as well, if everyone wants to be a presenter, can I just point from the other side of, of the coin? Yes, okay, it might be glamorous if somebody's doing your makeup, but there's a tiny wee percentage of people, A, that will get to do that, but B, the lifestyle, well, one minute someone likes you and, and gives you a chance to present a World Cup, the next minute you've got no work. Mm. Someone else will come in and they, they don't rate you and then you're like, okay, who do I work for now? And you have no income. Pandemics come along, you're earning a certain amount every week. Lovely. Pandemic comes, no income, nothing, not a penny. Um, so it's very, very precarious. There are so many different sides of it. And if anybody is interested in, in the on-air side of things, then um, I'll tell you the good sides <laughs> as well. No, but the reality, and I think that's what this panel has to be about, is, is giving people um, an honest assessment I of think how it, things are. I think we need to have an honest conversation about being a presenter, yeah. that it looks great, but actually, I mean, you know, when, when we get a, a goal in 96th minute or something, everything changes and it's just it's really hard <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, stressful. Job. it's a really it's stressful. hard job to do and i you know i and i'm not trying to kind of say no you, sh you shouldn't be a presenter but i think sometimes i get people saying to me oh i really want to be a presenter i've just left university great but you're up against Caroline Barker, Jackie Oatley, Lindsay Hooper, Laura Gabby Lowe. Laura Woods Laura started Wood. on the papers with Alan yeah. Brazil and look at her now. Yeah. And, then, and, she's, and, and actually, I know Laura paints a picture of a glamorous life, but I've seen her diary. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy how she does it. I do but not know. But she's done that graft. She's, Absolutely. And, 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 and you get, I think you get a bit more respect from that rather than, you know, that there could be anybody that sat in this room now who could be literally walk in front and, and get it like that. And it, it's the set, I think it's the same for any presenter. It just doesn't come to you like that. Kelly Cates, the same one, mm. started off at Sky Sports News making teas and coffees, left university because she was like, I, should, I don't want to be at university. But that takes time. I think Kelly herself would admit that she, I don't know, Jackie, whether you think that you're better now. I think we're all, I'm a better producer now than I, what I was 20 years ago. Mm. 
it, it takes time and I think some people it's great and I think the fact that we've got social media and and I'm sat between these people are do, doing an incredible job you know I'm, I follow TikTok I'm on TikTok because of this one <laughs> but, and I, do you know what I mean and, but I think it's so there's a space for everybody but I think when sometimes when people come in and, and when um you know former players come in and they sit and they watch and they observe but you can always tell a good pundit because they just want to learn mm. and then they just like oh my gosh that's the, the hardest thing that's that's that how caroline you just manage it because you are spinning plates the and as a producer you're spinning like voices in your head constantly so i think learn your trades from the bottom up get yourself in and then you when you get there you will appreciate just how much you've learned on that journey the other thing is so you know don't run before you can walk but again i started yeah cleaning cars and recycling tape but actually my job at local radio was driving a desk so i drove the desk for victoria derbyshire who you might know um, and i drove the desk for years in fact I, I did it until i left the bbc 28 years later but from driving the desk i saw all the mistakes that were made saw what the producer did i worked on breaking news stories i was the person that i was the key person even though we sometimes say you know the person who pushes the buttons and like oh yeah all right but actually what i did was so important because it gets gets us on air and opens the microphones and and kind of you are the glue that puts it all together and i know because of back in the day i worked in digital if i'm producing a show i know now i work three things in advance whereas they don't do that now because we didn't have tapes and analog and everything but you know, that, that work that I'd, I'd even saved, the work that I did as a waitress, as a banqueting waitress, taught me how to work with people in, in the business as well and become a networker. So everything that you do, the skills that you learn are really important. So it's great if you want to be a presenter, but I absolutely will go by that. Learn the trade first. It doesn't hurt you to learn the trade. I, I'm, I say this all the time. I'm 51. Yesterday, I was 26 years old, and I blinked, and I'm here now. Like, I've not have, I've not have kids, but why have you not have kids? I don't know, I was 26 yesterday, and now I'm 51. Right? No, I'm not having kids, because I forgot. <laughs> and in the meantime, I've, I've had a great life. Don't get me wrong, I've had a shit life as well, but I'll show you all the good bits. But that's the point. You know, it's like, if, God knows, our time's running out even now. Um, and that's life. So get out, do what you want to do and enjoy it. But don't run before you can walk. And finally on that, actually, be careful how, when I said blag it, be careful how to what level you blag. Because if you come in and say you can do something and you can't, then I might not employ you again. I don't, like, mm, don't know if I'll use that person again. They said they could do it and they couldn't. So be careful on the blagging, but be confident in what you do. And actually, once you get in, just say, actually, I'd like to, could I sit with the audio team? Or could I sit with that team as well? So be open and honest but, and be confident. You've got a lad in, I don't know if you know, uh, I won't say his name, but he's, uh, he's in TalkSport this week. I know you Oh, bless him. He's in. Um, <laughs> and he's, he's a really good lad. And he was like, any advice? And I just said, when you're there, I said, make the most of it. It's not a case of pestering people all the time. Can I do this? Can I do this? Whatever they do give you to do, do it really well. But also listen to who's on air and think, oh, might they so-and-so is coming up next, I'm going to do a bit of research on that mm. guest. Actually, the producer might not have had time to know that this is a really good nugget of information. Just say, well, you might want to get the presenter to ask this. Do extra stuff. Go the extra mile. Mm. When I changed career, I bought a book by Andrew Boyd about broadcast journalism. And I think in the first chapter, it said, if you get sent out on a story to go and get a story, come back with two. And I've always remembered that. Go the extra mile. When I do my commentary prep now for Sky, it's ridiculous, I need to stop it. But I spend days and days and days doing prep. Days, like, I feel every single minute doing prep. And my kids are like, can you not just be at home and like play with us? I'm like, yes, I must, after I've done my prep. <laughs> um, so I'm not advocating that, but absolutely going the extra mile, being the best that you possibly can be, is an absolute great starting point. And if you don't end up doing the exact thing you want to be doing, if you've got other skills along the way, then you'll be able to do something else. So if you want to be a presenter, but you've learned production on the way, and you get to be a producer, and you get to spend your life producing radio programs on football, happy days, that's not so bad, is it? And you only get binned off when you're 50 as well, <laughs> when you're on air, which, you know, it's not far off. And um, Rihanna, it. keen to get more of your experience in terms of what you've done so far, and things we're all being honest about our lives and careers here. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've observed in this landscape of yours, the things that you like that you see. Yes, you've had opportunities, you're with Joe, that's great, you've got wonderful advice. 
but how do you observe the way women's sport media is? I think different than I think I would have imagined. I think it's a lot more welcoming than I ever would have imagined. You know, like I'm 17 walking into an industry where you have people who have been working in the industry longer than like I've been alive. Like I was talking Cheers. to Tim. You're welcome. Oh my God. She's brutal. <laughs> she's she's brutal. You said to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> You're not that honest. No. That's a team thing. Said then. Honest. <laughs> we said honest. <laughs> but like I was talking to Tim Stallman, who is Peter. incredible. His work in the women's game is incredible. And we were talking to him and just, I think for me, people like that who have been in the women's game since day one, having time of day for people like me who are just starting in the industry, who are still kind of finding my path and what I want to do and things that I like and things that I think work for me and learning my strengths and my weaknesses within the industry. I think having people being so welcome to give support and advice is huge. And I think people adapting with the times and changing with the times and learning, you know, social media is huge nowadays. And um, just to touch back to Charlotte, like Copper 90 gave me an incredible opportunity to come down to one of their meetings and, and talk about what I've observed in the women's game and what the women's um, football audience like and things that they don't like and how we can grow the game online. And I think the company's interest, especially off the back of the Euros, has been huge. And I think seeing people have that growth and interest and actually who want to sit down and listen and learn about what they can do as well to help with the women's game is huge, probably my favourite part. And something we haven't really touched on yet, but there's something that's different with women to men, I would suggest, is how we look is valued more highly and given more importance than perhaps um, our male counterparts, <laughs> possibly. I don't know, maybe you might agree. It's a fact. It's a fact. There we go. Thanks, Sarah. I told you she just says it straight. But do you feel a pressure to look a certain way? Do you feel a pressure to, oh, I, need, I haven't done anything on Instagram today or TikTok. I need to, I, here I am drinking my coffee. Oh, no, I'm going to take a photo of myself drinking my coffee. Do you feel that I have to... <laughs> that was a bit more than that, don't I... I? <laughs> <laughs> Paraphrasing the whole thing. But do you feel pressure in terms of the way you look is what I'm asking? Um... I wouldn't say so, um, just in terms of the field that I'm in. I've been like in the modelling industry for quite a while, so I think I've learned to, I guess, steer away from that and learn there's a bit more to your career and yourself and your abilities than just how you look online. Like, I think I posted a video last night on TikTok at like one o'clock in the morning. Like, I had like a face mask on, like it wasn't a good look but <laughs> at all. Um, but no, I think especially online it's like quite easy I think to get caught up in or like the likes and how your account's doing and um, I think learning to like take a step away sometimes is something that I'm still getting a grip to but you know taking a few days off and like not posting every second of every single thing that ever happens in women's football on TikTok like that's okay like you don't have to give everything you have to it but also only like bits that you're enjoying like if you're not enjoying it take a few days off like it's not the end of the world things you know the world will still spin life goes on but yeah I think how you look shouldn't define what you can and do. Shouldn't, but perhaps it does. I mean, I'd like to ask all of you briefly on this, if I may, because we'll, we'll throw it open to questions just now. But Nia, do you have any advice for people? And have you noticed that, um, that TV, for example, is more looks orientated for females? Have you noticed women that you've worked with being under more pressure in that regard? And do they have to conform to fit a certain image? I think women put pressure on themselves sometimes when it comes to it. And I think now we've got on on Sky Sports we've got Ailey, Caroline, Kelly, and um, Michelle Owen presenting our women's football coverage. Kelly's a mum. No, Kelly's a mum. Yes, Kelly is not. Um, you know, she's not six foot and stick thin, but she's intelligent and she's funny. Caroline the same. And then you've got Michelle, who is so open and honest on social media about the fact that she is a mum. So I think, that's ch I think that has changed because they're not there because of how they look. They're there because they're bloody good. And they've worked really hard to get there and, and grafted. And I think, I don't know whether, you know, I've seen sometimes Laura really openly comes back to people on social media and, and, and I think that stigma, I don't, I don't know, it was a question I was going to ask you actually about, you know, oh, you're a woman and you work in football, what do you know? Or get back in the kitchen. That kind of, I think it's, I think that when you've got people like Laura or Kelly or, or you know, Michelle had it and then Jeff stood up for Michelle on, on Soccer Saturday last week and said, yeah, I'm in a pair of pink trousers. Well, you know, I think you've got, 
I think now, and maybe learning from, from our younger generation, is that you call it out a lot more. So therefore, if someone's going to critique you about the way that you look, you're not there because you, mm. you, because of how you look. You're there, and if you, in the same way, if you're there and you're trying to blag it, you get caught out quite quickly. Mm. They're there because they're really brilliant presenters and knowledgeable about what they're presenting on. Deborah, is there anything that you've come across in in terms of um, the people that you use as image? Is image an issue for any of the people that you work with, or are you looking for a certain image? I, I think we're we're talking about presenters, but I also think there's a huge amount of pressure just outside of being in front of the camera the the comments that get made if in previous company you'd you'd come in and maybe you hadn't done your makeup that day it would be like oh are you feeling okay you're right my ability to do my job is not determined and if i decided to put on a face of makeup that day and i think you are often judged by how you appear or how you walk into walk into a room or how you hold yourself or how well your hair's done or your makeup's done. And actually, we need to break down that in not just this industry, not just in football, but in any industry, that actually our ability is proven by what we deliver, what we say, what we challenge. And um, I, I work with a huge amount of content creators, um, women in front and behind the camera. And it's upsetting to see so many people feel that they're worth is only kind of validated, one, on likes, two, on comments, or nasty comments. We always pick on, on the nasty comments, not the positive ones <laughs> of everybody saying how well we're, do, uh, we're doing. So I think there's, it, I, I don't know quite how we change it. I think male allies and our, our friends and our colleagues, both in women and in men, I'm very lucky to work with some incredible men who are huge supporters who know that if that conversation comes up, I'll call them out on it. If, if, if they make a comment on the way that I look, they, they ask, okay, how can I change it? How can we make people feel more comfortable that we're interviewing so that they are not defined by, the, by their looks necessarily, that it's what they're saying, it's what they're changing, what they're delivering. So I think it can come in every aspect of the industry, both in front of the camera and unfortunately behind it as well. Yeah. Any questions for any of our, woo, <laughs> fastest, <laughs> finger first, <laughs> you, <laughs> you are fastest and then you please, thank you. Please tell us your... Yeah, stand up, we've got yeah, about yeah. One, one question left, I'm afraid, so we've nearly gone into break. Oh, so gosh, go last one. sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name's Kayana. Um, I'm actually asking on behalf of one of my friends who couldn't be here today, for you, Sarah. No. <laughs> at you. you were saying you're desperate for female producers and she's been desperate to get into book sport and has been applying to a whole load of assistant producer roles, this, that, and she's been really struggling to get answers back. In that case, how do you chase what she's supposed to do to get in? Because she's and has she, got, has she got experience as well? Yeah, I think she's done volunteering and she's writing and she's helped out, but I think she's very early on in her career. So okay. She's, she's Try to apply to um, entry level roles. Yeah, so the apprenticeship schemes that we've yeah, got. Probably that. Yeah, so I mean, we've, we've run some really good apprenticeship schemes. Um, we've had one, our second kind of intern, um, we had six people that we've taken on. Um, on Instagram, I'm Colo27. Get her to message me on, uh, on Instagram, Colo27, and let me see, because I'm sure I'll know her name if she's been through, and then I can give her some feedback okay, as well. I'll let her know, that's cool. Great. Can we have one more from the yeah, from yeah. This lady here, had a hand. Do you want a mic? Do I need a mic? Yes, I'm, <laughs> <not>. <laughs> um, I'm from Bloomington Football, so we're a grassroots football charity. Um, I work in marketing. And I think something that we're like, looking to do is tell our girls' stories. Do you think that women's experiences should be pitched differently to mainstream media? Because sometimes we find that we're talking about periods or something. It really does depend on the individual that you're pitching to. Mm. So how can I pitch those stories in a way that is more universally accessible and do you think that there needs to be it needs to be women telling those stories or do you think that like the way in which men can tell those stories is also brings can I angles can I pick up on that so Rihanna's been on the show today it's called uh, inside the WSL the girls have been on as I said we sent Courtney Sweetman Kirk out in a sports bra in down to Portsmouth University mm -hmm. and got it to run to, because we were addressing breast movement on the show we've spoken about uh, periods on the show we've spoken about ACLs on the show uh, on the sh on the program last week 
we had this incredible interview with Melanie Lupold talking about how Chelsea supported her with, with um, pelvic floor after having the baby. There is a market for it, and I think that market has to be a safe space market. So we're really fortunate to have inside the WSR, as I say, and to have that safe space for people. Because also on that show as well, we've looked at the audiences, <coughs> and it is slightly more female, and we're kind of thinking, oh my gosh, but there's, there's men watching the show because it's an, it's, it's an education. I think if you are working in football, and our co male colleagues at Sky understand that, and I've been in meetings talking about white shorts. I wrote an article of white shorts and why it's important. It goes out to in, inside, inside Sky for people to read. If you are working in football, that is football. Whether um, if you're a woman, female footballer, it is slightly different. But if you are working and, and being part of that production, you shouldn't shy away from that conversation. If, if at some point a player is going to say, or a, a coach is going to say, yeah, she's really suffering with periods, so I've, I've had to take her off. That will happen, and when that does happen, not, not a single person in our gallery will, will bat an eyelid about it, because it's open and honest conversations, and I think we have to have that in football, and for our male colleagues to also understand, because they'll have daughters, sisters, mums, aunties. That's the reality of football. I would second that as well because I mean a part of what I do is I write for the Guardian mm -hmm. um, on the newsletter and we have a, a male editor but he's very wanting to understand all of the topics that are included in the game and how we can make it as much information put as much information out there as possible around those different topics and make it as accessible for his readers at the Guardian which is you know is a huge readership so um, I think it's changing as well mm. massively. It's about, I think as well, that going back to being unapologetic for being female athletes and rather than kind of dancing around the issues, these are the issues, they are what they are and it's, it's, it's almost on everybody else to catch up rather than us to try and pigeonhole information into certain, like this is where everyone can make a difference comes into play, right? Because if you're pushing out these stories, mm. more people are going to see them. So it's, I would say, be, let's not be apologetic about it and let's not try and frame it a certain way. It is what it is and it's, it's the more we're kind of honest about stuff, I think the more people start to catch up. Yeah, I think... A lot more articles now in the media about this kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say is the more we hear it, the louder it gets. And it's, it shouldn't be, oh, okay, th that person's talking about it so we can't, everybody should be talking about it. Everybody, it doesn't matter who the voice is, the message is being heard and you know I think that's the important thing ultimately to take from it is as many voices as possible is, is better than a few individuals picking out those key topics because they might be specialists in discussing it. It reminds me of a WSL game on BT a few years ago. I was, I was watching one night and uh, it wasn't a high profile game but I remember afterwards uh, Emma Hayes was asked, well, yeah, why do you think the defence didn't clear that cross? And naming, won't name the player. <laughs> Emma Hayes went, X, Y, Z players on a period. <laughs> so she, she literally answered the question with that. And I was like, oh my God. It didn't get picked up on social media. I don't know if you remember it. it didn't get picked up at all. But I was like, wow, I wasn't quite expecting that. But I think it's becoming the norm now to, to speak a bit more honestly about, uh, about the game. Because I think traditionally, talk about gratitude. We've always been grateful to have a platform. But we've always fitted into a landscape of media and football that's been created by men, haven't we? Um, and now we're speaking up about the realities of the game. And uh, thanks to a, a lot of these women here, women's football coverage and women in football coverage is going from strength to strength. So thank you all of you. And we shall break for coffee now and we'll be back at 3.45. Thank you.